promise not to do that. All right, we're going to go ahead and kick this off, hey everybody. This is Father Sibley here for our third installment of our Newman Lecture Series. Uh, as you can tell today, I'm in a better environment last week. I was, it was a darker environment. I had a computer on my lap. Looked like I was speaking to you from a cave, but this is much more professional looking now. I'm in the office. You can see the bookshelf in the back. Uh, and what's the Newman Lecture Series? For those who don't know, we've been doing this for over 10 years now, having a different speaker come in, usually before pre-COVID times, once a semester, to talk about a topic of interest between something in the secular world and the world of Catholicism. So we thought leading up to the election with all the passion about politics and social justice that it would be good to have a series focused on Catholic social teaching. And so that's what we've been doing. And I think it's been a pretty big success. Welcome everybody. I know others are gonna sort of be filing in during the course of our time here. Before I introduce the speaker, just to let you know, uh, the bottom of your screen is a little questions and answers. If you write your question down after Mr. Tubes has finished speaking, um, I'll present the questions to him and we'll have a little dialogue and hope to wrap things up right at about noon. So you can go back to work or doing whatever you want. So let me go ahead and introduce our speaker today. It is Mr. Jay Toops, uh, who is a parishioner here at A Lady of Wisdom. Jay uh, is a business consultant. He's been doing it for about 20 years and he specifically works with banks uh, and bankers. He also gives motivational speeches but he has a real passion for his Catholic faith. Um, and he also has a passion for economics uh, and Catholic social teaching in that regards, uh, particularly in the topic he's talking about today, something a lot of you maybe never heard about. And it is the idea of distributism. Um, so he's gonna explain a little bit more about that and how it fits into Catholic social teaching. He's put together a little presentation um, and so why don't we welcome Mr. Jay Toops for our Newman Lecture. Well, thank you, Father Sibley, for having me today. I really appreciate um, coming, and I'm excited about this. This is a topic that I am, I could probably talk on for hours as far as distributism goes. And I think it's important um, for everybody to get an idea of where I come from and how I came about um, the thought process of distributism. Then I'm going to share my screen and we're going to kind of walk through a presentation. So um, I lived and worked in the corporate world of major banking for the first 20 years of my career. And over time um, in that corporate world, which is truly the capitalist bastion, you know, after really working hard to climb the ladder, uh, I came to understand that not everything in that capitalist world lined up with my faith. And so I knew there were some things missing. So I began to um, look for what was real, I eventually started my own business on the consulting side um, and have moved, tried to incorporate what now I see as the distributive philosophy into the way I do business. And so, um, and what's interesting as I work with my customers and implement some of those distributive um, principles, their businesses tend to be more successful, their employees tend to be happier, um, and it tends to be a much better internal culture for those companies. And so Father Sibley asked me probably a couple of months ago if I'd be willing to talk on this, and, and I jumped at the opportunity to kind of share this thought process. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen as we go through here, and um, hopefully you'll find this helpful in you, as you think through voting this year and um, look at where are some of these principles applied in our economic system? So I'm gonna share the screen. Let's see if my screen can share. Um, Father Sibley, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. So I need to share my screen. Let's see. Oh, sibling. Hello. Well, as Father Sibley works to share my screen, I'm going to walk just walk through some of this presentation with you, and he can let me know when he's back on it. But um, you know, one of the first things that I, I like to think about is um, 
as we walk through this is uh, St. John Paul II. One of the, his quotes that he said in Miami of 1987, which I find really useful as we walk into this presentation is, America, your deepest identity and truest character as a nation is revealed in the position you take towards every human person. Now he was really talking about the pro-life position in that. And I also think that really applies to how we look at the economy too. So a, a properly instituted um, economy or economic system will take into a look at all people, all families, all individuals that live in the economy and work toward um, the common good of all of those. And so where does the distributism philosophy comes from? As, as you look at this and think about it, there are a few places where it, it comes and it's important to look at um, how they're working. Um, so the first one is a um, encyclical written by uh, Pope Leo the Thirteenth, and that's Rerum Novarum. It is one of my favorite encyclicals, if not for any other reason, um, but it is one of the easiest encyclicals to read. And as you read through it, it really rings true in how we live our lives. It focuses on the family, on the workplace, on capital, on labor. It focuses on um, what property rights. So it's it's um, it's a really strong encyclical, and I've been talking about it probably for a decade about how good it is. Then there, of course, there's Saint Thomas Aquinas and his philosophy embedded into this, into what often people refer to as the Third Way. Um, then there's a few encyclicals by Saint John Paul the Great, uh, Centimus Anus. You know, I apologize for my slaughtering of Latin, but. Uh, then natural law, and then of course, biblical authority. So though, if you look at those five aspects, distributism flows out from those and embeds itself in our Catholic social teaching. So um, as we walk through this, one of the things I like to do is just, let's start off with what is distributism? What is the definition of distributism? So distributism is an economic and sociological philosophy that places the rights and responsibilities of individuals, families, and communities at the forefront while working toward justice and the common good. Um, and what we have to recognize in that is the end goal is a societal structurally that wi structure that widely distributes wealth and property ownership. And so in today's world, if you think about it, and what I saw when I was working in the corporate world and the, in the major banks, um, there was a the distribution of wealth and property ownership, although it's become better over time, is not necessarily evenly distributed. And I'll share some facts and statistics about that as we flow through our presentation. So what's the current landscape? Oh, Father Sibley says I can share the screen now. So let me see if I share it. Oh, you could, oh, I, I, cut, I cut into it. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah. You've always had the ability to share. Sorry. There we go. No, that's okay. Let's see if I can get this shared right. There we go. And we'll move me down to the side. And here we go. So, what's the current landscape? In today's current landscape, you have two opposing views on the economy. One is socialism, and in today's world, we hear a lot about socialism. Um, it, it really is becoming very, very common part of the conversation in our political ideology. And the second piece that we hear, which most of us are fairly familiar with, is capitalism. So let's talk about what socialism is first. Um, the, the basic understanding of socialism is that it advocates for collective and government ownership of basically all property and distributism of distributing of those goods. So it says all property and ownership, all businesses are controlled by the state in some way, shape or form, if not directly owned by the state. Um, and we'll talk about the church's view on that and what Pope Leo XIII spoke directly to that. Then there's also capitalism which is really a basic economic system based on private ownership as a mean production, means of production and toward dealing profit out to the individual owner. 
um, in a capitalist economy, the owners of the business make all decisions um, for their own businesses, not the, um, not, the, not the government. Now, in today's world, you see there's a mix of socialism and of capitalism um, that has embedded into our society. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about both of those as you go. That gives you kind of a basic understanding of both. So as Catholic, why not socialism? So Pope Leo XIII in the late 1800s, I think around 1889, when he wrote Rerum Novarum, he very specifically condemned socialism. Um, and one of the reasons why he condemned socialism is because he, socialism intrudes on the rights of the family because it, it attempts to or works toward the transfer of property and ownership and decision-making away from families and toward the government. And so he said that that process of taking the decisions of families away from their own destination and how they make decisions for wage, wage earners, for their businesses, or even into just how they raise their families, he called that a great and pernicious era. Um, and I think, I think we have to reflect on that as we look at what is out there today that is really in many ways intruding deeply into our family and educating our children in a way that moves them away from our family. And so socialism really becomes what he calls that great and pernicious era. He also says that every man, every person, every human has the right of by nature to possess their own property. That goes all the way back, and I'll share that to you in Genesis, when um, the first thing that, G that God told Adam and Eve was to subdue the earth. Um, so that natural right of property ownership um, goes against socialism in that socialism by its nature, if you look what's happened in history, moves property ownership away from the individual and toward the government. Um, the other thing that um, Pope John Paul the Great said in uh, Centumis Anus is that it reduces every citizen to being a cog in the state machine. So what he means by that is it, it you know, one of the things I loved about John Paul the Great was that he really spoke a lot about the dignity of the human person. And socialism directly works against the dignity of the human person. And so I think that's uh, as we look at proper economics and proper Catholic social teaching, one of the foundations that we have to look at is in our economy and in economics, does it help the dignity of the human person? How does it create that justice for that individual worker, for the family, for the business owner? Um, now, John Paul, II, John Paul II took that right to property ownership and expanded that right because when he saw and wrote it a hundred years, wrote his next encyclical a hundred years later, he saw that that ownership or capital had become something more than just owning your own home or owning land. It, it included other forms of capital, such as intellectual property rights, um, such as stock, um, maybe perhaps a business of some kind that didn't necessarily have land involved that might be um, have some sort of inventory for sale. So he recognized and he expanded that right of property ownership past just the ownership of the home or the land which you live on. And so I think um, he called that a new form of property and, and used the word capital. And most of us in, in the business world, world have heard that word capital. And it's the thing that we can, um, that we base the strength of our business on is the value of our capital. So is capitalism the way? So before I jump into this piece on capitalism, I think it's important that we recognize that capitalism in of itself is probably responsible for the greatest level of prosperity that our, the world has ever seen in the last 50 years. So capitalism in of itself is not necessarily condemned by the church. And so I don't want anybody to get the impression of that. But I think the church recognizes that it doesn't completely fulfill the role that it should. And so um, the church recognizes and always recognizes the legitimate role of profit. And it never has never condemned extreme wealth, not extreme wealth, has extend, condemned wealth amongst people. So as you talk about distributism, a lot of 
um, youth today look at this and say and, and think that being wealthy is wrong. Well, being wealthy isn't wrong. It's really what we do with with the accumulation of wealth and how that is shared or how it works toward the common good of the individual. Well, we also have to recognize that profit alone is not the legitimate indicator of a firm's condition. And again, this comes from, um, from Pope John Paul the Great's um, encyclical. Um, it, we have to recognize that profit is a picture of the health of a business, but we also must recognize that the people that work at that business are the reason for the business's profitability. And so we have to make sure that they are treated justly and recognize their dignity in that process. And so I think um, as you, we explore distributism, you'll see how, how you can put some of those things into play. Um, Pope John Paul II said very clearly, it's not wrong to want to live a better life. Actually, that's a good. It's a good to want to live a better life. And so um, as you work through an economic system, it should work toward everybody working toward living a better life. He said, but the distinction is it's not just about having stuff, okay? Um, and so that's important because as we look at materialism that has become rampant throughout our society, sometimes often the pursuit of living better is really just looking at how big my house is or what kind of car I drive. And so um, that's really not the end. The end is to recognize the being, each of us individually. Is it making us a better person as we pursue to live this better life? Are we working toward the common good of the individual? And um, are we using our economic you know, basis in order to do that? So the big question on capitalism. So this is a particular quote um, that's a fairly long quote. I'm going to summarize some of it by John Paul II, where he talks about capitalism. And I think the first quote um, really more closely matches what it is to be a distributist versus the second quote, which sometimes we see common today. And so often I've heard distributism referred to as Catholic capitalism. And I think that's probably a good description of it. The church refers, refers to the economy directly as a business economy or a free market economy. And really what we wanna to work toward is a somewhat of a free market economy, but also focused on building the common good. So I'm gonna real quickly just read through a, a summary of this first quote um, where he again in his encyclical said, if you're talking about capitalism or an economic sentence, the fundamental and positive role of business in the market private property and resulting responsibility as a means of production, as well as free human creativity in the economic sector. And he says, that's most certainly to be affirmative. And so there, if you look at that, um, I think one of the things that is important to look in there is private property ownership and free human creativity. Um, it's one of the things that I enjoy working with business owners and small business, um, small bankers today is to recognize that human creativity in which they always look toward and how do I better those around me? How do I help other businesses get better? How is my, how am I integrated into my community? And that's a beautiful thing as we, um, as we move through and look at our economy. Now, John Paul II also said that if you look at it, it's meant as a freedom in the economic center is not circumscribed within a strong judicial framework, which places at its service human freedom. So human freedom and the dignity of that human person is should be central in some of the ways that we look at how we position capital and how we build our economy. But there's a particular aspect of that freedom, which should be at its core, the recognition of the justice of the human person, as well as religious freedom in how we practice our businesses and our faith. And when we get away from that, which sometimes when you look at capitalism and you work with those major corporations, um, they push that piece away and only look at how we're going to make a profit and they forget about the the core of that human person, which is extremely important in, um, as, we've, as we are looking at economy and businesses. So I wanted to share a couple of st statistics with you. Now, again, if you go back as far as the 50s, um, the numbers for um, poverty have significantly improved through capitalism. So I'm not giving a total um, sway against capitalism of itself. I'm just saying that it's not 
doesn't completely do what we're doing. So I um, mean, the 1950s capital uh, poverty level in some parts of the country was somewhere around 34% of all people lived in poverty. Now that's gotten better and it's hovering around 18, 19% of the population. But what you have to recognize, and, and just a quick statistic I wanted to show you, in 1973, we had 22, almost 23 million people living in poverty. That hasn't gotten better, it's gotten worse. And that's 38.1 million people living in, living in poverty or below the poverty level today. And these statistics come from the US Census. So this isn't j making up a statistic, it's something I looked up in the US Census. Um, and as you go out and look, and I think one of the things that I've seen, and I'll share a quick story. I, I went to Philadelphia recently to visit um, uh, the servidors that are in Philadelphia and they have a convent. And one of the things that it really, really, I mean, it truly impacted me was the level of poverty in some of our urban areas like Philadelphia. And this was in North Philly. And what really, what really impacted me was not only the level of poverty that was surrounded there, but the despair that has come along with that poverty. Now, if we're in a capitalist nation, we really shouldn't have areas that have fallen into despair. Um, and there's many, many different things that fall into that. But I think we have to come together to find multiple solutions to fix that in our, in our country. And I think that's a symptom of some of the things that we see going on in, um, in some of our urban areas today with riots and people setting fires to things and looting. Not to say that that's an excuse, because it's not, um, but I think it's a symptom of what's going on. The other thing that's an interesting statistic that I got off a site called Market Watch was 70% of all income in our country is isolated to 10% of the population. Well, if the church's approach is to have a more well-distributed wealth and more well-distributed income, if you have 10% of your people, of the population who is controlling 70% of the overall income, um, then what's going to happen there is you're going to continue to get a wider, wider disparity, and you're going to start to, at some point, have an increased number of people in poverty, which is what we have seen um, over the last 40 years. So um, what's, there is a couple of commonalities between socialism and capitalism that I like to point out to, world, to people is there's a consolidation of power at high levels in both areas. Socialism consolidates its powers at the high level of the state. So reality, if you look at other socialistic countries, um, the poverty level comes increases amongst the general population. And then there's a very select few who live in extraordinary wealthy type situations. Um, and that history proves that. I don't have to go out and show you all that, but you can go back and look at the socialistic economies of Venezuela, of, of um, Cuba, of um, so the Soviet Union, and see that there's a few that control how, where everybody's going and, and live in, uh, in extraordinary wealth. In a capitalistic society, um, power tends to over time, and we can see that today in our political system by the people that are driving and throwing money in the political system, the power is consolidated at the highest levels of the corporate world. And, um, and so, you know, um, one example, well, I'll share that example here in a little bit, but you can see that, that you just look at some of the way communication is. And um, I, one thing I like to tell people so they know is if you look at just the media, the media outlets today, true part of capitalism, right? Um, are the vast majority of the media outlets are controlled by about three or four companies who own them all. And then we wonder why um, it's a struggle to get information out of the media. So often people refer to distributism as the third way. So what is the third way? We're gonna talk about that. Um, I like to start this part with sharing a quote from, again, most of our favorite saint I think out there today, and that's John Paul II. And he shared this in the Baltic States in his visit. And you see from the picture I have there, he had millions of people. Um, and he is probably, along with um, Ronald Reagan, one of the reasons why um, the communists and the socialistic Eastern Europe, the wall fell. And so um, he has here, and I'm going to share this. So now, in this speech, he also gave a warning as they were rejecting socialism. He gave a warning about the inhumane aspects of capitalism if it uses the worker strictly as a part to enjoy, as a, as a, not as an individual, but as a, um, I guess, as a, you want to look at it more as a, a, a tool. 
And so he said he didn't hesitate to raise serious doubts on the validity of capitalism, the situation of exploitation as human, inhumane capitalism has subjected polar, uh, sorry about that, the people basically, um, since the beginning of society is indeed evil. So what he's saying is, is that the human person shouldn't be used as the capital. They are not the capital. They are the resource. They are the reason that a business is successful. Um, proletariat, there we go, I got it. Okay, so distributism and Catholic social teaching. So there's a couple of things that I think that we have to recognize. And sometimes when people um, talk about distributism, it springs forth the word of socialism. Well, distributism has nothing to do with socialism. Um, it has to do with the distribution or widely distributing prop property ownership amongst all people. So I believe that distributism successfully incorporates Catholic social teaching in an economic philosophy. And for myself, I've tried to build that in my business and work with business owners and small banks to incorporate that. Um, because I think um, as we look at what's happened in some of our smaller communities in the world, as businesses die off or people buy smaller businesses and then vacate those small communities, it does harm. So the distributist ideal is to create an economic structure that has a widely distributed property ownership. Um, here's a, uh, a quote from G.K. Chesterton, and it comes from his book on the superstition of divorce. And G.K. Chesterton is one of the leading um, philosophers around, around distributism. And I think this quote pretty much incorporates a lot of thought processes around most distributists. And it says, too, too much capitalism does not mean too many capitalists, but too few capitalists. And so what he's saying is, is that when you have an overabundance of unregulated or unfettered capitalism, it tends to gobble up all the small businesses um, and leaves huge gaps in wealth and prosperity in the communities. Um, anybody who's driven around the state of Louisiana into some of these small communities can see that that's happened in a, in a lot of places. And as you look in some of the large communities where you have heavy urban areas, you can see that as well. So let's walk through the basic principles of distributism. For those of you all looking at this, I think you'll really um, appreciate this first one more than anything else. And that's the family is the foundation of society. So, you know, uh, Pope Leo the Thirteenth really spoke most of a large part of his, uh, the encyclical in the very early part about talking about the rights of the family. So he was laying the foundation, and the church has always laid the foundation that the family is the central unit of society. Um, it's in the Catholic Catechism that it says it's the original cell of social life, going all the way back to Adam and Eve. I mean, since the beginning of time, the family has always been the foundation of society. And if in the society where you are focusing either on the government or at a corporate level that rejects the family, um, we lose that aspect of the family. And we can see that the family today is under significant attack. Um, the principle of subsidiarity is also a part of this um, foundation of the family because it, as, as we talked about in the previous presentations, it says larger communities should not usurp the family's prerogatives or interfere with its life. Now, there are qualifications of that in situations of abuse or neglect, right? But in situations that are not abuse or neglect, the larger community should not usurp the right and the authority of a mother and a father to figure out how to raise their family and support their family. You can see through COVID this year how that has kind of intruded with people who have not been able to sort their families, um, support their families because businesses have been shut down. Well, that kind of, if you look at this, this goes against that in a lot of ways because we can't remove the rights of people to support their families. Um, because statistically, again, I don't have that statistic with me today, but if you go back and look at what's happened, poverty throughout the world has increased because of business shutdowns and people not being able to work. So distributism would strike against that simply because, simply because of the principle of subsidiarity. Again, another quote from G.K. Chesterton. G.K. Chesterton says, um, that the foundation of the family, he's referring to the family, it's older than law, it stands outside of the state. Again, we, I think we instinctively know that, that the family is the foundation of society, but I think in, a, in an economic world, we have to understand that the strength of the family economically 
And if, it, if the family is not strong, it erodes against our, our economy. So the second principle I wanna cover is the common good or solidarity, okay? So the first quote is from Deuteronomy, it's be no poor among you. So if you think about the principle of distributism that says that property ownership and wealth should be well or evenly distributed as much as humanly possible amongst all society, this helps you understand that or see that there's a possibility that it can significantly reduce the poor among us, all right? Um, and then according to St. Thomas Aquinas, he said, the common good is said to be the common end. So it's the end of all businesses is to, of course, we, we must, you know, this, a health business is gonna create profit, right? But also, it's also gonna to contribute to the common good. Uh, John Paul and a couple of his encyclicals talked about that uh, the just in of itself, because the business, because the business is selling a product, um, you know, morally and ethical products, um, that in of itself contributes to the common good, whether it's a grocery store owner or the person who's um, sewing clothes and a seamstress or um, the person selling Mary Kay products. The, because it employs people, it allows people to um, successfully support their families, and because it sells a product that there is a legitimate demand for, it does in of itself contribute to the common good. And so that'll also tell you that there's a leaning towards smaller businesses that um, produce inside of our economies. Um, the second principle of distributism, and which I really work with, is a lot is is the respect of the human person inside of that um, inside of that working for the common good, and the social well-being and development of the human person of itself. And so I think it's important that um, as people, one of the things you find is people can support themselves as that wealth is more evenly distributed because you have a reduction in poor as a result, and that does indeed create a society where the social well-being and development of an individual group itself is going to be better. And um, so principle number three in here, and that's the well-distributed property ownership. And I think it's interesting, you know, if you talk to people, most people as they grow up, not all people, but most people as they, they grow up, they have this dream of home ownership or they have this dream of having their own land. Um, and I think that's a natural, just but through what with our, with our Lord laid on our heart in Genesis that said, go forth and subdue the earth. He naturally laid that on our heart that, that there is something right about owning a home. There is something right about property ownership. And so um, we have to create a society and an economic system that will allow that to be um, more easily attained and maintained, not just attained, but maintained. So um, here we go, and, and God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply and have dominion over the fishes in the sea. That's, that's from Genesis, it's in the very earliest part of the Bible. Um, and then I think one of the things in Rerum Novarum that Pope uh, Leo said was the practice of all ages has consecrated the principle of private ownership. And so as you look today and you look at the vote today, you know, that's always um, the, the thought process is really high in our minds today. We have to look and see where is it going to be that our vote is going to contribute to people to be able to own their own home or own a business or private property ownership. And so we have to form your mind in the Catholic social teaching realm that this is an essential part of it. A lot of people sometimes look at that and, and when they're looking at social justice, they forget that aspect of property ownership and they dump it for, you know, maybe environmentalism or some other, um, other part of the church's teaching, but they reject the right to property ownership. And each of us individually on our heart, our Lord has laid on our heart that we have the right to property ownership. So subsidiarity is a, a principle that I'm particularly passionate about. And I, I'm not gonna go in terrible detail on this, but I think, um, it's, again, it's one of those things that we know instinctively, but sometimes society today works at, works against it. And the principle of distributism in the business place, you know, one of the things I have found is that if you can push decision making out as close as possible to the front line or where the customer meets the business, right, that typically that business will be more successful. Anybody who has had to get on the phone, it's a, it's a 1-800 number and you're calling somebody in another part of the country who 
has a hard time understanding our good Southern Cajun accent will recognize that we much prefer to go face to face on the business. So it's really interesting that the, uh, the church's principle of subsidiarity when applied in the business place is a very effective tool to grow a business and be successful. So um, this was probably the first principle of distributism that I embraced and felt most excited about because I found it really true that it applies. And when you have businesses um, and families that are able to make their own decisions and not be forced into a decision path by somebody else, they're gonna be successful. And so this particular principle, and again, when you think about business, when you think about your vote today, this particular principle is the bulwark of limited government. So what does that mean? That means that if you're going to have a distributive society, a society that focuses on the spreading of wealth, the best way to make those decisions is local. Again, you know, I'm sure it'll probably be controversial for some people for me to say this, but if you look at um, COVID and what's happened in COVID, um, is it really proper for somebody in New York City to make a decision on what happens in Lafayette, just Lafayette, Louisiana? No, it's not. The people of Lafayette, the local authorities here who we can reach out to and talk to should be the ones making those decisions. Um, so a limited government fits well within a distributive society. And principle number five is just wages. And so again, this is something in my own business endeavors that I'm particularly passionate about. So it, it very simply in the Catholic catechism, it says a just wage is a legitimate fruit of work. So in a, in a distributive economy, you know, and, and you talk to other distributists, what they will tell you is it's not just a living wage, but that if a person who works for you helps your business make money, they should, and you're profitable, you know, as long as the business is healthy and profitable, they should be able to, at some point, as a point of justice, share in the profitability of that business. I'm not saying that they should share all the profitability of the business because the business owner has put their own personal capital at risk in running the business. But there's a percentage or a certain part of that profit. If you're going to be just and treat them with true human dignity, um, for their work that they should be able to share in, okay? And I think that's it. It's, it's a piece oftentimes when I work with businesses that is missing. Um, and sometimes it's very controversial for me even to say that. You know, I've had some very interesting conversations with a majority shareholders of some of the companies that I work with who, who don't want to share their profit in any way. They think that they're paying enough for their employees. Um, and so... But inevitably, what's interesting about that is inevitably when you are able to show that their wage increases as a legitimate fruit of their work, the employee is more engaged in the process. And then the outflow of that, the outflow of that, of them being able to have a better living is what? A more distributed wealth. Why? Because they have the ability to go buy a home or they have the ability to buy a car or they have the ability to educate their children um, the way they want to. And so it ties together really um, very neatly into that distributive uh, philosophy, okay? Um, Pope Leo said in, you know, that a, a person should have the ability to support himself and his family comfortably, not in poverty, not at a living wage. Uh, for example, you know, a lot of people, now I'm not, I want to qualify myself here. I'm not going to say that the government should go out there and tell everybody what their wages should be. I don't think that at all, at all. But I think as a part of our Catholic faith, we need to recognize in Catholic social teaching and participate in that, in that aspect of it so that we more adequately pay people. You know, one example I, I like to give is often you go to work with a business and you have the office manager who's making, who's running the day-to-day -day operations of the office, who's making $35,000 a year. And then when you go talk to the owner of the business, they're making $400,000 a year. Well, then they wonder why that office manager who sees this gets angry and disgruntled, you know, because so, it's not just, I'm not saying that office managers should be making $400,000 a year. No, because the business owners had their capital in it. But certainly a percentage of that profit tied to their performance should be pushed out to that, to that individual office manager because they are an important piece of the business and it's part of showing them the dignity of their work. And this is a common conversation I have with people. Um, 
so reality check. So um, because I spent a large part of my career in um, the banking industry, I like to give a comparison as I talk to people on the reality check or distributism in real life. And so I spent uh, 20 years in working in the major national or what I, today are the super national um, multi-trillion dollar um, banking system. And um, this isn't a slash so much against that as much as that as you work in there and you see that and you see what happens in the, some of those systems, it doesn't necessarily line up with what I see is the living of my faith in everything that I do. And so in the last 20 years, I have um, suggested uh, moved my life toward working in the community bank system. And so I'm not doing this to make everybody go out and run and open an account at a community bank. But I want to use this as an example of what is the difference and how both look and compare to a capitalistic society much, as, much uh, against a distributive society. And so there are distinct differences. And when you look at them, you can see that one really does kind of lend more toward our Catholic social teaching. So um, if you look at the major national banks um, today, and this is really true of most major national corporations, their decisions are driven strictly by stock strike price. I can tell you that having sat at the table with the most senior executives of the, one of the largest banks in this country, that the decision was not ever about the customer and it was not ever about the worker. It was always about the stock strike price. So I'll share a real quick story about that. Um, I was in, um, I'm not gonna say where I was, because I, I, you know, it would give away who that company was, um, but I was sitting at a table with a number two guy um, at the bank that I worked for. And he, it was a, they were a trillion dollars at the time. And we were going through some actions that we're gonna take in the state of Louisiana. And ultimately my role there was to give them direction and advice and, and what I thought. At the end of the day, they had adversely affected 35,000 families, increased pricing on all of them, um, had raised interest rates on their loans, um, and um, basically had taken 11 million, they had improved the company by $11 million, which, you know, that in of itself would not necessarily be bad, except that the, what came afterwards when I questioned it, I said, well, I understand what you're trying to do here. But my issue is, is that you have adversely affected 35,000 families. And from a business perspective, you are going to lose a large chunk of that. His response to me was, Jay, it's just a decimal. We are not worried about those people. And that was one of those days I said, I am in the wrong place. <laughs> so um, I began there. It took me about another two years to kind of get myself out of that situation. Um, so that stock market driven, stock price driven thought process that removes the dignity of the human person, the families and the common good out of its thought process doesn't line up with our social teaching. Um, number two, they have no or very limited local decisions. So again, if you think about subsidiarity, right? Um, if there's no local decisions, if the decision is made being made for Lafayette, Louisiana in New York City or Washington DC by these large corporations, they're really not considering what happens in this community. Again, I'll share a true conversation. This happened to me after I started my business. I was with a, working with one of my local uh, bank customers in another part of the state. And he called me up and said, hey, look, we need to meet. So I drove out there to meet him. And he said, the local um, paper mill is probably gonna shut down this year um, because of the drought. They were having a drought and I won't give you all the details by it, but the, the drought was causing some problems. And so they were gonna have to shut down the, the paper mill until the drought was finished. I mean, it would have affected 3,500 families. And his response in that world, again, think, and he's a Catholic, he's a, a deacon in the Catholic church. He's really a good guy. He's one of my favorite people. He said, we're gonna have to figure out how to help these 3,500 3, families. Well, I had a friend of mine who was working at the large bank um, down the street. And he called me up and said, look, man, I'm gonna need a job. And I said, why is that? He said, well, Corporate, uh, the corporate side of the business heard that they may be shutting down the paper mill and they called me up and said, look, I wanna know how quickly you can shut down this branch once that, um, once the paper mill is shut. Different philosophies, right? One is about the local community. We're gonna have to figure out. And you know, now part of that is there is a selfishness behind wanting to figure out how to help those families. I get that. And that 
the local community bank lives and dies by the success of this community. On the flip side of that, the major national bank, it's not going to hurt them one way or the other if they shut that branch down. Another way to look at the differences, again, in decisioning, and this is something I'm, I'm really, really passionate about, is if you look at the corporate side of this, those major national banks no longer do much to invest in their communities as far as local lending, so helping people buy homes or cars. Their, their thought process behind that is just give them a credit card. Um, and they're giving people credit cards at 24 to 29%, which in my public opinion, although not legally, but my, my personal opinion is usury rates. Whereas the community bank is going to give you a, a loan for what you need. They're going to make the decision. I had a buddy of mine recently called me and said, hey, look, I need to borrow $5,000 for um, an air condition. He said, I went to the bank. They wanted to give me a 29% credit card. I don't want a 29% credit card. I gave him the name and number of a friend of mine that works at a local place, and he gave him an 8% loan. So what's the difference? You know, certainly the person who's doing the 8% loan is not making a huge amount of money on that, but he recognizes the good in helping this individual put an air condition in his home, the common good there, um, and has foregone some level of profit in order to do so, but he's doing what's best for the bank and for the individual in the community. So I think it, it gives you a good idea to look at that. You know, often when I talk to distributors and one of the first things I ask people to do is raise their hand. So, okay, who works at, who banks with the big banks and who banks with the small banks? And we have, we have a conversation around what's the difference between the two. Um, and so in the capitalistic world where things get rough, sometimes they just vacate that market. In the local world and the working with local businesses and community banks, what I have found is it really gives you a real clear picture and the differences between um, the distributive philosophy and the capitalistic philosophy. So practical application of distributism. Let me give you some examples in today's world of some practical applications of distributism. I'm running low on time. I see Father Sibley, so I'm gonna blow through the, some of this. Is um, I told you, I get excited about it. I could talk about it for a couple hours. Um, first one is homestead exemption. I mean, that obviously is um, a way to help property ownership, standardized deductions, um, opportunity zones, um, first time home buyer programs, limited interest expense, deductions, preferential programs for low to moderate income home families, low rate rural lending programs, preferential tax benefits for families, uh, per performance bonus programs, family farms, small businesses, um, small local production companies. So here's the last thing. What do we do next? I think explore as y'all have, for those of you who have watch parties, explore the thought process of subsidiarity. I think that's important. Um, Keep it local, buy from local businesses. Um, if you're decision-making, work for just wages. If you're a decision-maker in a business, just go start a business. For you guys that are young people out there, think about what you love and go start a business. Um, do a victory garden. A lot of us during COVID did a victory garden. It kind of just helps you understand and, and see that the, where that fits and um, help the disadvantage of participating in the economy. And I think that's gonna flow through in our next week's talk. Um, reading material. I'm just going to leave this up here and um, for you to look. Now, the last thing I'll say before we take questions is um, if you want a copy of this presentation, because there's a lot of detail in here that I didn't necessarily cover, um, you can reach out to, I'm going to throw Annie Decody in front of the bus at Wisdom. Annie's probably smiling at me from the other wall. Um, and she, I'll be glad to get this out to you. She'll get, get my email and, and give your, me, me your email and I'll, reach, I'll send it out to you. So that said, Father Sibley, I'm going to stop sharing my screen if I could figure out how to do that and turn it over to questions, I think. Well, Jay, that was a fantastic presentation. Thanks for all the work you put on that. We have a few questions. Um, I guess let me ask you a question first. Um, and we kind of heard from it what Dr. Roberts had to say last year. I mean, the evidence is clear on one part that capitalism has really helped the Western world get out of poverty to a massive degree. Absolutely. While on the other hand, it has consolidated wealth um, amongst a handful of people, the extreme wealthy. And so while here we have distributism and certain other economic theories as a way out, why do you think, I guess, so many young people today don't recognize the good that it's done 
and I guess in a certain sense, just hate the rich so much. You know, it's because I've had I've had that conversation with some of the young people, um, and we've had them over at the house. And I, I think, honestly, some of it th there's two reasons probably. Some of it is um, perhaps maybe a lot of them haven't had any interaction with some of our, our, our more wealthy Catholic people who do a lot of good in the community. And so I think um, I think as we accumulate wealth, I think we have to reach out in the community and do good with those. And I'm not saying go out and brag and talk to about do that, but I think we have to interact with them if we want them to see that. But I think also today um, they see the gaps. I think a lot of them have gone out and done mission trips or they've gone into communities like I described in Philadelphia and they see the gaps and they see that people are driving by in their BMW or whatever it is they're driving and ignoring what's going out there. And so I think it's a self-inflicted wound on our case that we need to remedy. And, and it's not hard to remedy, but I think it's something that we need to remedy. Um, and I think there are some solutions to that. I think also, especially when you go into some of the smaller communities, you see that sometimes there are a dozen families that own all the wealth and they haven't reinvested in their community to help their community survive. Um, and so, I mean, I think it, it becomes kind of a natural response to that. Um, there again, there's nothing wrong with having wealth. Um, I mean, and we, and Pope John Paul II said that. I, I think it ends up being, what do we do with it, right? That's a great, that's a great answer. I come back to the question. Hopefully, we've got a little time later on. A question here from uh, Mr. Jean Paul Lansaw. Why, in your view, does the state not have the power to regulate a just wage? Would not an integral estate better serve the common good? Because I think it intrudes on the rights of the business owner. Um, you know, you can go over regulation, but I think the church doesn't say that the state has that right. The church says very specifically in Rerum Navarum that a wage is justly negotiated between the business owner and the individual. Now, it also says that the business owner has to recognize um, that they have the upper hand and we have to recognize that we, it still must be a just wage. But the church does say that it's the negotiation happens between the business owner and the individual. Um, I think um, in a heavily regulated society, it tends, you know, distributism is more for local. So when you, I think um, if you wanted to say it would be okay for a local economy to describe or define what a minimum wage, I think that would be fine. Um, I think, but there's no way for the folks in Washington, D.C. to decide what a minimum wage should be in Lafayette, Louisiana. One, they don't care. Um, number two, they have no idea what it would take to live and survive here. Um, and our one representative from the area is not a strong enough voice to, um, to object if they set it up too high or they set it too low. So um, an example, you know, the living wage in um, in New York City, just a plain living wage in New York City is somewhere in upwards of 17 to 18 dollars an hour. Well, the living wage in Louisiana and Lafayette specifically is 11 dollars and 26 cents an hour. Mm -hmm. So um, the local authority, if you use subsidiarity, right, the local authority should have the right to do that. I just don't think it should be set up at the federal level. So uh, well, that's a great answer. One of the several of the questions that I've received um, kind of tie into this. So we recognize subsidiarity as a valid principle that things that can be handled on the local level ought to be handled local level because the, the larger level, the federal government really doesn't know what's going on nor cares what's going on at the local level. What are some things that uh, a society faces or let's say yes faces that you believe or the church would believe should be handled on that higher level? Well, I think um, points of justice, you know, I think a point of justice can be very easily handled on a higher level. So um, I think some of the things that you can look at from the point of justice would be regulation of interstate economy. So I think it's very difficult for a local Lafayette, Louisiana to regulate interstate economy to what six I'm doing. Today, our economy has become more global. Um, so um, the import export rules should certainly be at a national level um, because I think it would put those give the local business owner if they're going to be an import export business, the opportunity to compete at a better level. Um, so I think it, if you, when you look at it when it raises up at much higher levels, 
Um, it probably should be regulated at a federal level. Um, but we have to be cautious about overregulation because um, just my personal experience and just working in the banking industry, um, we have to be cautious for the unintended consequences of some of those um, federal regulations. So for instance, um, the regulations on how um, local banks can lend money end up limiting the number of people they can lend money to. Um, so we just have to kind of be careful about it. But I think when you look at interstate commerce, or international commerce, certainly the federal government needs to be involved in that process. Yeah, and one of the things that I, I've suggested we talked about before is that the federal government should be supporting the local government in dealing with the problems locally. And one of the ways it normally does it is through churches and religious organizations. But because of the way that our current system interprets separation of church and state, unlike other countries in Europe, where the federal government does support the local system through the churches, uh, we either say it's not possible or put too many regulations. So I would say that that's another way that they can help, but you can't have too many regulations and like a different understanding of the role of religion in society is important. Um, another question, uh, can, you, can you give a particular example of how you've applied distributed principles in your own consulting business? Okay. Yeah. Oh, I'd love to do that. <laughs> um, so one of the, <laughs> the biggest thing that I work toward, um, so there, there's, is um, one, the principle of subsidiarity, right? That particular principle of subsidiarity, which is embedded in distributism in decision-making process and going out and helping business owners figure out how to teach their entry level or the local managers to make decisions based on the impact of the business, the employee and the community. I call that the three legs, the business, the employee and the community. Um, the other piece that I, um, I've really worked in is the just wage piece. Um, so figuring out how to justly pay somebody based on their poor performance and contribution to the profit. Um, and, and in the community banks, um, as I work with, because probably 80% of my customers are community banks these days, one of the things that we work for is figuring out how to propagate property ownership and small businesses to be opened in their communities because obviously there's a symbiotic relationship between that bank and the community doing well. Um, and so we implement programs to help them figure out how to do that, um, which really gets kind of exciting when you see a business owner open their business for the first, first time and be successful. Oh, that's a great, great answer. Well, um, another question, uh, what would you say, how do you apply distributism to a nonprofit business or a nonprofit organization? Well, I think, um, you know, that's, that's an interesting question because I haven't really thought about that real heavily. So um, I think a nonprofit, you see nonprofit world typically are local. Um, and if you look at, there are some certain nonprofit businesses out there um, that would help with homeownership. You know, there's, we used to do a program called Christmas in October in New Orleans when I worked at the community bank there, where we would go out and help people who owned homes. Um, and it was a nonprofit program. We worked it through a nonprofit, um, helped people who own homes, remodel their homes when they were destitute poor, help them be able to figure out how to buy homes, those kind of things. So there's certainly places for that. In nonprofits, um, again, I think um, there are foundations. I think we have to today, if we're going to be successful in um, kind of getting our word out there, I think there would be some foundation opportunities to help business owners. Um, there are foundation opportunities in distributism about helping first time home buyers, helping people get into their home for the first time, helping people start a business. And I, there are foundations out there that do that. Um, Catholic Charities is a good example of that where they're, they're helping um, some of the poor people figure out through um, home, home ownership, first time home ownership. So those are certainly um, nonprofits that fit well in the distributive philosophy. That's a great answer. Oh, I guess we're going to kind of wrap up with one other question from uh, Ali Casey. Hey, Ali, what's going on? As a young person, actually in the process of starting my own business, we dream of taking our e-commerce e business nationwide. We believe in the mentality of act local, we think nationally. Do you have any advice for us as we continue to get started? Like what advice would you give to a young business person who's actually out there? The doing first it? thing I would give them is, um, and, and, you know, business advice or my faith advice here is pray, <laughs> pray a lot, make sure that you're doing what God wants you to do um, in this business. And it sounds like it's something that you're passionate about. Number two would be do, do what you believe that you can be very good at and passionate about. 
Um, and the other thing that I would look at is always make sure as you begin to employ people that you treat them justly and fairly, um, that their wages match their contribution to the business in such a way that it, it shows justice. Um, and don't ever be afraid to live your faith in your business. Don't ever be afraid to do that um, because people know who you are. And um, if you stop, if you try to separate your faith from your business, people will know that and it will not ring true. Um, it's interesting to see today, you're about the third or fourth person that I've talked to in the last several months who've asked, how does distributism work in that uh, software type business? And I say, well, you know, first thing is, is um, it is a local business. Like you said, think work locally, think nationally. Um, and then make sure that um, understand the impact that you have on those communities through, as Pope John Paul II said, you know, understanding that your product produces to the common good and it produces the common good wherever it is distributed. Um, I think that's kind of the basic. I mean, I could talk on that probably for an hour, but I'll give you the basics there. Let me ask one of the questions somebody just put in, which I think is a really, really great question. Um, how is something as important as the environment uh, get addressed and safeguarded through distributism in your view? We know, of course. The well, I mean, I think um, the art, we have to think we have to think of a more of a conservationist type approach. Um, a distributist you know, is going to love the land. So I think it fits very well in that thought process because of the right of private property ownership. Um, and I think there is a right to somewhat regulate that people, people are misusing their property that destroys, um, you know, has pollutants and those type of things on it. Um, but I think as the environment goes, it goes hand in hand with it. It's not opposed to it, if that makes sense. Um, so I think there's a, you know, I think that we have to be careful in not over restricting the use of property to where people can't live and support their families. Um, but I think that we also have to recognize um, that we can't also abuse the property. Yeah, it's one of the things Dr. Robert said last week that uh, conservatism defined and understood properly means we're going to conserve our resources and uh, Correct. Conserve our environment. Um, well, just one last thing, you give me a brief answer. What country region right now do you think, if any, is the closest to establishing a widespread use of distributism? Lafayette, Louisiana. Oh. <laughs> now I'll tell you, I've, driven, I've traveled all over the country. Um, and I will tell you that small communities, smaller, rural, more rural communities, not all of them, but small, small communities, um, I find sometimes hotbeds that are more, they don't really recognize that they're in the distributist world, but they're more, uh, they're, they're more leaning toward that. There are some small communities that are not at all leaning toward that. Um, and, you know, I'll give a, give a small example. Um, I have a, a customer that's in Winsboro, Louisiana, and um, there are some really good Protestant brothers of mine. I've become very good friends with them and they really live and breathe this stuff. And when you talk to them, they're figuring out how to work in a community and how to how to help people own homes and how to also make sure the bank is the bank is making the money and the employees are just wage. So um, I will tell you, having traveled all over the country, I see that more embedded in more rural communities and smaller communities than I do in the larger communities. Oh, that's good. There's so many other questions, um, and I really appreciate your, your 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 insight here. And so, thanks so much, Jay, uh, to let our listeners, happy to do it. Our viewers, know. Uh, Jay provided some questions, some resources that will be available on our website, um, and I think this video will be up on YouTube and hopefully social media very very soon. And thank everybody for tuning in. Next week we're going to have Sarah Bakke with the Catholic Charities talking about the preferential option for the poor. And I also want to thank everybody who, who tuned in in the past couple of weeks who took the Ministry Partner Challenge and who became ministry partners or, or just gave any kind of gift to support our ministry and the great things that we're doing to spread the faith. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more about being a ministry partner, just go to our website, regengagingcatholics.org slash donate so you can sign up. So thanks so much, Jay. I really appreciate it. And thank I hope you. everybody has a wonderful day.